You're listening to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast, episode 29, released in mid-September 2020. Yes, we are still on lockdown, but the Who Room is considered safe and essential. On today's show... Whoever is in league with the intelligence could still be amongst us here. I talk about a collectible that you most likely cannot get. So now I have your attention. In collection protection, your Funko Pop boxes finally get protected. And an outrageous offer that tops... One million (laughs) dollars! I wish I was kidding, but I'm not. And sorry for the non-Doctor Who clip. I end the show with a mystery audio clip, so stay tuned to the entire episode. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here is the great Fraser Hines. Y'all say who? Welcome back to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast, the podcast that explores the world of Doctor Who collecting, Doctor Who collectors, Doctor Who collections, protection of your collectibles, and of course, Doctor Who merchandise of every shape and size. I am very happy to present our 29th episode, broadcast sometime in the middle of September in 2020. I am Larry Van Mersbergen, your host, and I've been a Doctor Who collector since 1981. In 1984, I had this crazy idea of opening a Doctor Who store in the Chicago area, but two things were kind of standing in my way. First of all, I was 15 years old and couldn't drive a car, and secondly, I had very little money. I did, however, have a lot of Doctor Who items that I was managing to import from the UK with my meager allowance and side jobs. So I decided to do it anyway. And after visiting several Doctor Who clubs in Chicago and one incredible visit to the many companions of Doctor Who in Chicago, uh, my second customer became my partner and the rest is history. And that history can be found in a book called Red, White, and Who, the Story of Doctor Who in America from ATB Publishing. And that mention is on page 384. There is a link to buy this book directly on our main page at DoctorWhoCollectors.com. Our theme song is Who's Doctor Who, composed by Barry Mason and Les Reed, performed by the great Fraser Hines, who played Jamie McCrimmon in over 117 Doctor Who episodes, the longest-running character on Doctor Who, and a dear friend of the podcast. I want to thank everyone who became a friend of the podcast. You can support us a number of ways. Firstly is find us on Podbean at DoctorWhoCollectors.Podbean.com. You can also shop for your favorite Doctor Who items on our eBay store. You can find it at the short link bit.ly backslash DWC podcast. Since sometimes we can't keep everything in the Who Room, and I often get duplicate items, we try to keep the prices Reasonable, of course. You can hear this podcast anywhere you get your podcasts, including the Podbean platform. We are a very proud member of the Doctor Who Podcast Alliance, and you can hear other great Doctor Who podcasts at DoctorWhoPodcastAlliance.org. Be sure to join us for Chicago TARDIS 2020, the virtual edition. Due to the COVID-19 restrictions, uh, this convention will be virtual, so I believe anyone can attend, as most of the panels and uh, discussions will be live-streamed via the Chicago TARDIS Facebook page. I am hopefully will be presenting my Doctor Who collecting panel, as I have in years past, from the Who Room here in Aurora, Illinois, which means I can share more than usual. I, I often take a huge cart of boxes to the convention, and I remember bringing it into the room in the previous panel and telling the, the woman who ran it, I said, don't worry, this is for the next one. And we had over 55 attendees at the uh, collecting panel last year. So thank you for making that a success at Chicago TARDIS. Uh, 
You can find out more information at chicagotardis.com or visiting their Facebook page. It's another great Chicago Doctor Who experience. You can find us, uh, the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast, at DoctorWhoCollectors.com or on Facebook or Twitter and now on Instagram. We'll be posting our collectibles gallery on Instagram all all the way going forward here, including what we talk about today. So far, we've picked up a few followers and a lot of great comments. Keep those comments coming. We'll read those comments on the air as they come in. On the show coming up today, we have Collection Protection, our featured story and the most outrageous offer coming up. Sad, Red, isn't it? People spend all that time making nice things and other people come along and break them. Collection Protection. For all my collection protection needs, I trust Bags Unlimited Incorporated for all my archival needs. You can find them at bagsunlimited.com or you can call their toll-free number at 800-767-2247. Please tell them you heard about them on the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. Today I want to talk about protecting your boxes. Several items come in boxes, like the Funko Pops or the action figures. And so Bags Unlimited now offers crystal clear box protectors. They are sized to perfectly fit your video games and cartridges, as well as uh, protectors of CD cases, DVD cases, VHS cases, and other great boxes. Uh, They're made from 12 mil crystal clear archival polyester material, semi-rigid. Boxes come with a removable protective film to prevent scratches. Uh, Use these to protect your games, tapes, LP records, Betamax, VHS tapes, DVDs, audio cassettes, CDs free from dust, dirt, fingerprints, scrapes, scuffs, corner crushes, and scratches. Worst thing about having a boxed item is if you, ah, darn it, I bumped into something and now the corner is crushed. Um, You can actually get... Um, if you go to their, their page uh, online, you can get a gr- direct link. Uh, they also offer for Funko Pop protectors, comic book crystal clear box protectors, uh, all kinds of box protectors. Um, almost everything in my collection is protected by some product available at Bags Unlimited Incorporated. So remember, um, hopefully people are not out to break your things, but to prevent that, I would go to Bags Unlimited Incorporated. More after the break. Hello fellow time travelers, I'm Tony Witt with the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast, the podcast in which we undertake the insert adjective here task of discussing in story order all of the Doctor Who novelizations. I'm joined by... Dalton Hughes. And by... Alison Fitzsafry. And we record our episodes twice a month. You are listening to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. Enjoy your travels! I would like to invite you to take a trip across all of time and space. Join us in the police box as we discuss the worlds of Doctor Who in a completely random order. We discuss it all. TV stories, audio adventures, novels, nonfiction books, and on and on. I'm your host, Eric Branson. I would be very happy if you join me for the Police Box in the Junkyard podcast. The Police Box in the Junkyard podcast is a proud partner of the Video Junkyard podcast and can be found on most major podcast platforms including SoundCloud, Podcast Addict, Stitcher Radio, Google Play, and Spotify. You are listening to the Doctor Who Collectors podcast. And just a few notes before we go to our featured story. I was very happy to be part of the last episode of Police Box in a Junkyard podcast where we discussed the story Arc of Infinity, which was in the 20th season of Doctor Who. And I was very lucky to see that at a convention in Chicago in 1983. It was not even on television yet here, and we got to see Arc of Infinity. It was a really great treat. So I do encourage you to see hear that podcast. And the Target Book Club podcast is in the Tom Baker era now with a new theme song and going through the Tom Baker novels, which should get them going for a little while longer. I just had the pleasure of listening to the Ark in Space. So if you're not following that podcast, you should be following all of those podcasts along with this one. Uh, I have been a guest on both of those podcasts, and I do support them fully. Up there is the scanner. Those are the doors. That is a chair with a panda on it. Sheer poetry, dear boy. On to our featured story. Today I'm going to talk about a collectible that may not be obtainable. 
by other collectors. I got extremely lucky here. But I'm talking about a failed project or a project that never went to market. It's called BBC Doctor Who The Target Book Collection. Speaking of Target Books, um, it was supposed to include a magazine about the specific story, a reprinted hardcover edition with dust jacket featuring the Target logo, making it the only Target classic hardcover. The only other Target hardcover is the Target Storybook, which came out recently. And when I discovered this further, the dust jacket is fully reversible. There is a secondary artwork on the other side, and I took pictures of this and posted it on our Instagram page. So let me start with the magazine. Now, um, this was a project that never went to market, and only a few of these, I, I'm guessing, are prototypes, uh, were given out to select people. I received this from a friend of mine who got it as a promo, um, and I guess one item was spotted on eBay but was yanked before the auction closed. So my guess is he figured out it was priced too low. But anyway, uh, the magazine uh, features pictures from the story The Web of Fear on the front cover, including the Yeti and Patrick Troughton, and indicating the first appearance of Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart. And going through the magazine here, um, and I will try to take pictures of this magazine as best as I can here. Uh, they start with an introduction to Doctor Who and the Web of Fear about uh, the Yeti stalking London Underground, um, and a picture of the hardcover book that's included, and I do have the hardcover book with the magazine. Um, a little thing here on setting the scene, which is a direct sequel to The Abominable Snowmen, um, and uh, sometime after their early adventure in Tibet, where the normally placid Yeti were revealed to be robotic servants of the Great Intelligence. So that's on the inside cover, and then the first section here, the story from script to book, a comparison of two mediums. So there's... Um, Kind of a there's a picture here of the script and a picture of the book page where it was adapted. An extract from uh, chapter two and a little bit of the script from episode one uh, it was the camera script by uh, Mervyn Hazeman and Henry Lincoln, with a couple of snapshots of the of the story. So you get to see exactly where it went from the script to the book, which is kind of interesting. And then. Um, the next page has a wonderful picture of Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart with the second doctor. And the title of this article is From Screen to Book. So talking about how they adapted, basically how Terrence Dix adapted the book for, from the story to the Target book. It was an early Target release. And then the next page, a, a nice uh, um, story here about the writer himself, the late Terrence Dix. Uh, of course, this was published prior to his death because they only include his born date here, not his death date. Um, so I, I can't place a date on this project. There's no copyright date anywhere that I can find, and I've looked through this pretty carefully. Uh, anyway, a nice uh, uh, collection of his works at the bottom, including The Making of Doctor Who, the original uh, a story of the Sarah Jane Adventures, uh, which was a novelization he did, and Moonbase 3, which is um, six episodes were created in 1973, and that was all there was for one series. Um, and then the next page here was a, is a gallery of all the different covers that the Web of Fear had from the original Alan Wingate hardback uh, cover by uh, Chris Achilles to the first uh, Target painting by Chris Achilles to the current uh, one, which features the current Doctor Who logo with the original Chris Achilles uh, logo. On the other page is the neon uh, reprint, which has the Alistair Pearson artwork. And the 1994 Blue Spine edition, which they actually say here, Artist Unknown. I have to do my research to see if the artist is actually known for that cover. So that's the center, not quite the center spread, but I get to the center spread. And um, there's a section here on fictional facts on Terrence Dix. No other writer has been as prolific as Terrence Dix when it comes to the Doctor Who novelizations. His first book was Doctor Who and the Auton Invasion, as we've discussed, but it lists um, I guess 64 of the 161 Target books um, were by Terrence Dix. So, uh, including some very early ones. Uh, Day of the Daleks, Abominable Snowmen, the Giant Robot. Some wonderful stuff. Uh, on the next page, uh, the, an article now in the TV episode. We have a picture of a unit soldier at the top, the first um, appearance of, of the unit team. 
and also a picture of the title sequence uh, featuring Patrick Troughton's face, and a little bit about who wrote the story, who directed it when it was broadcast. Uh, it was originally broadcast from February 3rd to March 9th, 1968, and uh, features a little bit of the casting. Um, of course, on the next page, a little bit more about the uh, TV series is a wonderful photo of Patrick Troughton, Fraser Hines, and Deborah Watling. Um, all by all the by the way, wonderful people. I was very blessed to have met all three uh, of these actors. I met Patrick Troughton back in 1985, a couple of years before his death. Um, I met Deborah Watling months before her passing. Um, very sad about that. And Fraser and I continue to talk to this day. He's a he's a wonderful man. If you've never met Fraser Hines, you're missing out on just an incredible. Uh, guy all around, but uh, definitely somebody who's answered many questions, has a lot of insight on the series, and he's he's even provided lost scripts to the Big Finish people for uh, publication. So on the rest of this page here, they include some telesnaps at the bottom, uh, some pictures here of the Yeti, uh, and talking about how the snowmen return, and a little bit of the page from the Radio Times, which is the British TV guide. The next page, uh, back on the TV story, a little, little article here on Colonel Lethbridge Stewart and um, the trailer. Following the broadcast of Episode 6 of The Enemy of the World, a specifically recorded trailer was broadcast to publicize uh, The Web of Fear. So I believe that's on the DVD release, uh, but correct me if I'm wrong. I have not checked as of, as of this recording. Uh, more telesnaps at the bottom of the page. Uh, the Battle of Covent Garden is on the other side with selected pictures of Unit uh, battling the Yeti. And on the next page, um, a little bit of story about the missing and found. So the fact that not all of the episodes of The Web of Fear were recovered, um, but most were. And uh, they talk about how that, you know, how that came about. And then, of course, a little bit about the sequel. And there is a, uh, a wonderful... Wonderful picture here of, um, oh, gosh, is the, the, name, uh, the name escapes me at the moment, but The Great Intelligence and the Doctor Who Christmas Special in 2012. Um, the Great Intelligence uh, be taking the form of Dr. Simeon. And uh, the actor's name is just escaping me, but it'll come back to me probably when I insert it into the podcast later. And then um, the top four moments uh, on the next page of The Doctor Meets the Yeti in Episode 1, The Yeti Attack in Episode 4, The Intelligence Revealed in uh, Episode 4, and The Headquarters Destroyed. And in the back cover, it says, Your next book in the collection, if this had been continued, would have been Doctor Who and the Zarbi by Bill Strutton, uh, which would have included a hardcover book. Uh, the book itself is about the same size as the W as the Alan Wingate uh, hardcover, which I have. Um, and looking at them side by side, the only difference is that this has a Target logo on the spine, uh, purple spine, as well as on the corner of the front page. Uh, the inside of the book, uh, the book itself is a white um, cloth bound book. There's no imprint on the uh, book itself. But when I picked up the book out of there, there was a second dust jacket on the back of the of this one with a black spine and a different um, alternative artwork on, of, of Doctor Who and the Web of Fear, which I have posted those pictures to Instagram. Uh, on the inside book here, it's the original um, printing here. It's, uh, it says a Target book published in 1976, a division of the W.H. Allen and Company, which is interesting because... Ellen Wingate was not related to Ellen and Company. Uh, there were two different companies. You could see two podcasts back. I talk about that. And uh, also just the original. It's a, a really clear um, print. They do the changing face of Doctor Who. A little um, uh, narration, uh, narration here of the history of Jamie and Victoria. And then the, the story itself. And then towards the end of the book. We have a little bit about the authors here, Terrence Dix, and about Mervyn Hazeman and Henry Lincoln, which is really interesting. Um, and um, then the back cover. The back cover is slightly different. I'll have to take another picture, but it says um, basically has the, um, the trailer here on the back. This novel is based on this story featuring the second Doctor with the cover illustration by Chris Achilleos. Again, um, I had uh, consulted uh, David J. Howe, who's a friend, uh, another dear Doctor Who collector, has the Doctor Who Collector's uh, Memorabilia Museum in England. Uh, he was a guest um, on my podcast uh, at Chicago TARDIS, and he and I have become really good friends. And I asked him about this, and he said that um, 
He didn't know much about it except that it was a project that probably was proposed, a few prototypes were made, and then it never went to market. So I asked him about a ballpark figure of what he thought it might be worth, and he estimated 1,500 pounds sterling for this. And I thought, wow, that's a lot of money. It's, um, I didn't do the conversion yet, but a little over $2,000 um, for this type of thing. So um, it's not for sale, so I will not accept offers at this time. It is uh, considered the one of the prizes of my collection, an item that is not generally available. Um, any item that is not generally available tends to be worth more than something that was available. You know, for instance, the, uh, you know, we keep talking about price gouging every once in a while, and I see copies of Genesis of the Daleks, the uh, Ellen Wingate uh, hardback with dust jacket X library for as high as $700. But a lot of those were printed. So I'm kind of wondering why it merits a $700 price tag. And I'm looking at an item here that didn't get to market. It was never sold. It was never on available for wide use. There may be only five or 10 of these available are out there. Uh, I don't even know. I couldn't even tell you. Um, I doubt there are more than that. Um, my guess is that this was very expensive to produce. When you produce a hardcover book with Dust Jacket every month, based on subscriptions, I'm guessing, if they didn't get enough in subscriptions or they didn't project that they were going to get enough for this, um, it wouldn't be enough to simply just put it on the market because it would probably be too expensive um, to produce. And that sometimes happens. You know, I was in publishing for five years and uh, we had a project that cost so much. It ran over budget by a lot to the fact that didn't matter how many we sold, it was never going to meet the costs. It was going to be always be a loss. Uh, and so that that sometimes happens. Uh, if if anyone out there has um, and, uh, you know, any kind of information about this. Now, this is the book is not in mint condition and neither is the magazine. It has been handled um, quite a bit. The, the dust jacket's a little bit uh, tarnished on the front cover. The book is really kind of crisp. There's no writing of any kind. Uh, the magazine definitely looks like it's been well thumbed through. Uh, probably is, this may even be a review um, edition. There's nothing on here that indicates a proof. Sometimes they stamp proof in the book. Those, if, you, if they do have proofs, those would be worth slightly more because those were not supposed to leave the publishing house. Um, when I worked in publishing, again, sometimes proof copies were distributed to the editors. Those were not allowed to leave the building. So there you have it. This is a item that I wish I could tell you more about, except that the information is very, very limited, even though I consulted an expert. Um, and I checked the web, nothing on Google. So if somebody has knowledge out there that they want to share, please hit us up at Doctor Who Collectors Podcast at gmail.com, or you can reach us on any of the social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Just search for Doctor Who Collectors Podcast, Facebook and Twitter at Doctor Who Collectors Podcast. Uh, thank you for listening. There is no plot. I am being completely honest with you. And now it's time for my favorite part of the program, the most outrageous offer. And today I have an outrageous offer that most likely is not for real. It has to be a joke because this is probably the highest price I've ever seen for a Doctor Who item. And like I said, I'm holding on to a, an item I just spoke about that might be worth $2,000. I don't know. I haven't put it up for sale. I don't have plans to at the moment. But I wanted to tell you about um, a book that I discovered. It was sent to me by someone who did not want to be named, but Doctor Who, The Clockwise War uh, by Gray, Scott, Ross, and John, uh, published by Panini Limited. Um, I found a, a seller here in Georgia, USA. Um, they've been a seller online since 2010. And they're asking for, and everybody better sit down for this one, the listed price is $999,999. So we're talking a million bucks here. One million dollars! <laughs> <laughs> With $3.99 shipping, so that's the only reasonable part of this deal. And I'm... Uh, the Clockwise War presents the final 12th Doctor adventure by Scott Gray, John Ross. Um, also, classic tales of the first, fourth, and fifth Doctors is played by uh, William Hartnell, Tom Baker, Peter Davison from the long-running comic strip uh, from the official Doctor Who magazine and from Doctor Who yearbooks. 
a little bit about the store. Uh, I don't want to give away the name, but there it says they're one-stop shop for all your media entertainment needs. We feature comic graphic novels back, um, hardcovers, role-playing games. Uh, we guarantee the condition of the book, um, which they don't list here, by the way. Uh, it says, well, it says new, but that could mean anything. So a new copy of this book for nine, for a million bucks. Well, I, of course, it, I looked this up. You can get this book new for as little as $17.28 or used from basically $12. Uh, there's no one's going to buy this. This this has to be a mistake. It has to be somebody on uh, from the store who decided to have a joke. Um, I did reach out to the store and did not get any comments uh, from back from them. Uh, and it's still up there, too. By, for the, by the way, if you want to search um, Abe's Used Books, Doctor Who the Clockwise War, and see if you can find the million-dollar Doctor Who book. Anyway, it definitely won't sell for a million dollars, but um, we did manage to order one for $17.28. Um, I love these. Keep them coming. If you find an outrageous offer, an offer on eBay that seems a bit high, an offer on Amazon.uk that you just think, wow, that's a lot of money, or Abe's Used Books, or anywhere where you find that the price is just a little too high. We've had all kinds of submissions here, so you can hit us up on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Uh, you can use our email. Our official email is Podcast at gmail.com. Put outrageous offer in the subject line so we see it, and include all relevant links. If you wish to be named, leave your name and where you're from, and we'll be happy to read that out loud as well. So this has been a most outrageous offer. And that concludes the Doctor Who Collectors podcast for this edition. Um, we look forward to doing more Collectors Roundtables. If you'd like to be part of the Collectors Roundtables, give us a, a, a notice on one of those platforms and we'd be happy to include you. We put out calls to the various Facebook groups, including the Collectors Club, the Target Book Club, um, the Target Book uh, page, and other related Doctor Who pages with the hashtag Doctor Who. So... We're, we'd love to have you on the podcast where we always look at issues that face collectors today and would love to hear what other people have to say. So if you're interested in uh, hearing more about that, our previous episode was the first Collectors Roundtable, which was really fun to do, including uh, we had people from the United States and England involved with that, um, and it was a lot of fun to do. Um, so today uh, I'm looking at a surprise audio clip ending, so you can stay tuned to hear what we're going to finish out with. Keep traveling, keep collecting, and enjoy Doctor Who. Have a good one. Well, I'm Nicholas Courtney. I play Brigadier Alistair Gordon Lethbridge Stewart. So, what's actually happening today around here then? Well, they're having a little event, mm. aren't they, which involves a uh, sketch from, uh, well, created, written the last week or so by John Nathan Turner, which I appear with the Cybermen and have a little mini battle with them. A few explosions go on. And. Um, it's a it's a 25th anniversary, I think, today of a long lead exhibition, and we're all down here to celebrate it. And we've just done a long autograph session. And then shortly after, we're going around the exhibition, having a look at that. It'll be auctioning certain Doctor Who memorabilia. Yeah. Then we'll be doing another reprise of the sketch we've just done, and then I should be driven back to get a train back home to London tonight. <laughs> so you're a veteran. If that's not oh, rude. veteran conventioneer. Absolutely. No, it's not rude at all. No, not the slightest. Um, You've appeared in Doctor Who. Is that fun, working with all the different Doctors? Yes, it is. I've been with all seven. Really? Yes, I've been with all seven. I was with William Hartnell, you know. I really? got killed off him as a character that, but I was with William Hartnell. I've been with all six since him. Since him. Uh, of course, not, not with Paul McGann. Not at the moment. What do you think of the new Doctor Who? Um, I, I, like, I like the first uh, half of the film. Not, I didn't like the second half so much. It, it was a bit too special effective for me, I think. Doctor Who sort of used to used to have small budgets and we used to um, use our imagination. I mean, the, the special effects were very good, but it was a, perhaps a bit Americanized. Oh, so you, somewhat towards the end, you know, a bit too much so what flashing, do you see flashing for, lights. What? What do you see for the future of Doctor Who? Where well, would you like it to go? Where would I... Well, I don't know. I don't think it matters where I'd like it to go. <laughs> where would everyone else like it to go? That's the thing. I think as long as it retains its... Um, as long as the writing stays good and it retains... I think it's got to retain its Britishness, I think, to work. Um... He can go on for a long time, making them lots of good actors who can... Well, I'm Paul McGann's well, but he was very good. I liked him very much mm. in the film. Um, but uh, anything can happen, I suppose. You mentioned you went to conventions. What, what are the fans like? 
Oh, very appreciative and very generous and uh, very polite. And uh, they're, 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 they're different in America. They're very, uh, they're very enthusiastic in America. They were. They're, we used to do lots of conventions in America in the 80s. It was a cult, the program over there. I went across 14 times in one year on one occasion, 14 conventions all around the States. And they were very um, over-enthusiastic and very direct. And, uh, and the pictures are slightly more laid back in there when you go to do a panel, you know, you do a question and answer session and talk to them. Uh, the British are slightly more reserved than the Americans were. They used to ask you very direct questions indeed about your private life. <laughs> <laughs> do you find that they're very starstruck or is it... Um... America, yes, possibly more. <clears throat> and there's more... I find there are more women fans in America, I found, yes. And in this country, there are more male fans than there are women. That's what I've found. I wonder why that is. I don't know. It's very interesting, that. Although today, I must say, having done my autograph session in the queue, there have been an array of delightful-looking ladies. It's very nice to see so many of them. Well, it's a wonderful weather for it. Really. It's wonderful weather for it. It's a nice part of the world, so it brings the nice pretty ladies out, which is always <laughs> pleasurable to the brigadier to look at. <laughs>